Thank, thank you. Um, I, I always uh, like to start with this. First of all, what I'm going to um, discuss today are things that, as interventionists, you should know about, and also things that you should stay away from, because um, you're going to run into certain types of inflammatory vascular diseases and that you probably should avoid. But just to start this, I was always um, taught that you need keen powers of observation. So what I'd like you to do is tell me how many letter Fs do you see in the body of this slide, OK? So here's the slide. So everyone who sees at least one F, raise your hand. How about two? How about three? How about four? One person, two per people, five? One person, six? One, two, three, four, five, six. So, up here? No, I said in the body of the. So I've shown this a thousand times. I'm not kidding you. Audiences of this size and 5,000 and three quarters of the hands go down after um, three. For some reason, we don't see the F in the ofs. But anyway, um, this patient comes in and really her chief complaint was, I look like a frog. Um, what do you think she has of, of these four things? Any ideas? So this is really characteristic of our tortuous arch vessels. This would have an implication for you guys. Um, uh, limb years is separate thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein. Uh, carotid body tumors don't look like this. Um, you, you rarely even need to get imaging, but to prove to the patient that it's really just a tortuous vessel, I think imaging is fine. What, what is this called and what does it mean? Excellent. And it means? Good. You guys are too good. I start easy. What do we have here? IVC obstruction. So this is occlusion of the IVC and the hepatic vein. You wouldn't know that just from looking at this. And then when you restore flow to the IVC, the collaterals just, for the most part, disappear. And it's amazing how many people you see with this where somebody tries to do something with these collaterals, which obviously would be devastating. Here's a young man I recently saw who has these dilated veins here. And as you are all probably aware, um, he had May Thurner syndrome. May Thurner is when the right common iliac vein compresses, uh, the iliac artery compresses the left common iliac vein. Occasionally, it can compress the right side too. This is why two thirds of all DVTs are on the left side. And it's not uncommon. And this actually is treated, this is when, something you should do something for, treated with thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy, and then venous stenting. Um, and with some of the venous stents now, they're very high radial force where um, you don't get compression of it. What about this? You go by in the hospital and you see this patient. And really, I mean, the diagnosis can be made just from looking at this picture. Any ideas? Yeah, you're getting there. Um, first of all, the feet are like cyanotic. There are dilated veins. You don't get dilated veins in arterial disease, predominantly. So this is phlegmasia cerulea dolans. This is um, iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis. And for whatever reason, um, this is very painful, um, massive, red, purple leg, diminished or absent pulses. This is a limb and life-threatening emergency. You get blood into the leg. You can't get blood out of the leg. For whatever reason, all the collaterals are thrombosed. So eventually, 
the venous pressure and the tissue interstitial pressure overcomes arterial pressure. So if you did an arteriogram, you'd see blood coming down, 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 and then it would just end at a point. So this is one of the forms of venous gangrene. And here are some non-reversible changes. This patient I saw after coronary bypass surgery, they had heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So 50% of these people have an underlying malignancy, and um, about 20% have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So they need to be looked at very carefully. This is the first case I saw many years ago and it was not recognized, and it ends up with venous gangrene. Once you get to this point, you ended up with a bologna am amputation on this leg and a transmetatarsal amputation on the other leg. So what would you say about this? Anybody have any idea? Yeah, what is that? Yeah. Okay, you definitely get to participate in the four question quiz I have coming up for one million dollars. Um, this is a livido type pattern, okay? And, and this is absolutely correct. This is erythema abigni. Now, why do I show it to you guys? Because it could be mistaken for something like atheroman assembolization. And, um, but it's localized to this area, and this is called heater pad dermatitis. So in places where there's a lot of cold weather and you don't have good heating, this can occur, and if it's not recognized, this never goes away. But you shouldn't go on a wild goose chase looking for, you know, embolization of plaque and things like that when you see this. This has nothing to do with intervention, but you'll be called on a Friday or Saturday night by one of your colleagues uh, um, spouses. I usually get called because somebody, their finger turns this color and they're afraid they're, they have gangrene, they're gonna lose it. Any ideas? This is spontaneous venous hemorrhage. So you can make the diagnosis over the telephone. Um, it's not going to help you interventionally, but it's going to help you when you get called and somebody tells you their husband or wife has this. And uh, you can just, it's, it's non-painful. It lasts for two or three days. It goes away. No one knows why it occurs. This is pretty easy. Okay, so Paget Schroeder. So it's really the correct terminology is axillary subclavian venous thrombosis. In a young, healthy guy, the most common cause is Paget Schroeder's from what? It's from thoracic outlet syndrome. So venous thoracic outlet syndrome. So it's also called effort-related thrombosis. This is um, uh, something that occurs in young, healthy people, usually in their dominant arm. And in the outpatient setting, it's almost always due to thoracic outlet syndrome. In the inpatient setting, it's due to pacemakers or uh, central indwelling catheters. And here's a 90-something-year-old with a pacemaker. I've never seen somebody this old develop such great collaterals. So in, in, this, in, in this particular case, this is prethrombolysis. The subclavian veins occluded. This is a collateral vein there. This can be making, mistaken for a subclavian vein in an ultrasound. And then post thrombolysis, it looked like this. Um, the patient then underwent a first rib resection because if they don't do that, it's going to reoccur. And they're often left with a fibrous band like this. If the surgeon doesn't take care of it, then you guys need to put a stent in there. Otherwise, they're going to rethrombose. A lot of Major League Baseball pitchers have this. They get both the arterial and the venous form of this. David Cohn from the Yankees had the arterial form. This uh, is a healthy person who um, walked off the curb and developed severe tense pain in their calf. And they were told they had a deep vein thrombosis. I mean, it was really painful and really tense. And this gives you the clue what this is from. So this is a rupture of the medial head of the gastroc. I show you this because you put these people on heparin, 
or any anticoagulation, you cause a compartment syndrome and they can end up in real trouble. So really, if you do an ultrasound, you look up at the gastroc insertion point. A day or two later, they develop this. This is called the scimitar or the sword-like sign. This is where blood um, tracks down and deposits in the ankle. Okay, this is really important. It's really rare and really important. Anybody know what this is? If not, then this is the question for the million dollars. If someone knows, I have another question. So these are the skin manifestations. The person is blind. And this is uh, the most likely pathology that you would get is atherosclerotic SFA disease or coronary disease or aortal iliac disease. So this is pseudoxanthoma elasticum. This is called plucked chicken skin. This is due to an abnormality in the AABC gene. And the reason why this is important for you is you probably should not do intervention on these patients because there's an absolute contraindication to antiplatelet agents and anticoagulation. So if you put a drug eluting stent in these patients, you can't give them anything. Because if you do, and they're not already blind, they will go blind. And if they're already blind, they'll have massive GI bleeds. And most of these patients know this. There is treatment for this now. There was just a paper published in Jack on the biophosphonates for this. But basically, um, you ought to stay away from these patients. If they need something done, they should have surgery. So what do we see here? Well, here's a Livido-type pattern on the side of the foot. You have a purple or blue toe. You have it in both heels. So this is atheromanous embolization. And you know it occurs above the aortic bifurcation because um, you see it in both feet. This is a disease of the aorta for the most part. And it's amazing to me that we don't see more of this with all the catheters that are passed up aortas that look like this. But this is infrequently seen now. Now, the one thing about this is these are ischemic ulcers. And patients who have this have um, pain that's disproportionate to what you see here. So um, really, the treatment of this is to find the source of the atheromanous embolization, if you can. Um, we published uh, a paper on aortic stent grafts to prevent recurrent atheromanous embolization. Much of the time, they come from the arch and the ascending aorta, in which case there's not a lot that you can do. And this is just primary livido. It occurs predominantly in women, associated with coolness. It's temperature dependent. You don't want to go do sclerotherapy or something like that for this. You want to reassure the person. If you need to treat it, you can use a calcium channel blocker, but many of these individuals have low blood pressure. Now, this is something you will see. Um, and you'll, if it's sent to you, it'll probably be sent to you with a diagnosis uh, of atheromanous embolization. Um, these are, they burn and they itch. And this has a seasonal variation. In other words, you don't see this in the summer. You see this as the winter gets, what did someone say? Frostbite. Well, it's a variant of that. This is pernio, or what used to be called chillblains. This is a cold-induced vasospastic disease. And it's misdiagnosed as, um, as atheromanous embolization, and therefore it leads to a lot of investigation that's unnecessary. So these are just some of the ways it looks. It comes on as the cold weather comes, and it goes away as the warm weather comes. And the treatment is to treat the patients the same way you would treat someone with Raynaud's, instructing them to keep warm, and use a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Here are just some other appearances of this. All right, um, what symptoms does this patient have? I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, what's the name of the blood vessel? with the white arrow, and why is that vessel so large, and what's the name of the overall condition? So, what symptoms? Well, first of all, does anybody know what this is?
an absin in IVC. So this is, this is time, this CT angio is time for arterial studies, so you're not gonna see veins real well. But, ba what is it? Yeah, okay, well, that's a good guess, but it's not correct. You have compression of the renal vein, left renal vein, between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery. That's called nutcracker syndrome. We just put a stent in a, um, we just put a stent in a 18 year old who had this. So what symptoms does it produce? It produces flank pain, testicular pain, and hematuria. What's the name of the blood vessel on the right? It's the gonadal vein, because pressure in the left renal vein is so high, the gonadal vein comes off the left renal vein and you have reflux in the gonadal vein. Um, that's the reason why it's so large and the name of the overall condition is called the nutcracker syndrome. So uh, it's very easy to diagnose on a, a good CT angiogram. But when you see a gonadal vein like this in a normal healthy person, it generally, if it's a male, it generally means um, that they have some kind of backup in the renal vein. If it's a female, it could be due to pelvic congestion syndrome. All right, a couple coronary cases. 73-year-old woman presents with acute coronary syndrome. She gets taken to the cath lab. This is seen, and a stent is placed. So she has no cardiovascular risk factor, zero. What is this? The interventionist said it was athero. I said, did you do IVIS? Yes. Well, let's look at it. I can't find the images. Well, this is not athero, okay? Um, every other blood vessel looks normal. You have a very focal LAD stenosis. Um, this is post-stent, great result. Um, it ends up that her um, CRP was 110. And actually, she had no blood pressures in her arms. Despite the fact that she'd been seeing a cardiologist for years, and every visit, the blood pressure was 120 over 80, exactly. So um, this is an ultrasound of her subclavian artery. This is giant cell arteritis, OK? Um, this, you can see this concentric wall thickening in the subclavian artery on ultrasound. And you can see that both subclavians are occluded. Okay, so there's no way that they were getting blood pressure. So this is giant cell arteritis. It's important to be able to, to you know, 999 cases you guys do are gonna be athro. And then every now and then you're gonna get something like this. And this is important because this patient needed to be pulsed with steroids because they thrombose in the presence of acute inflammation. And I've been following her now for 15 years or so. No. No radial pulse. Would what be normal? Yeah, well, it would be normal in most people. Um, she actually had critical limb ischemia of her right hand and needed a carotid brachial bypass. But, um, you know, most people with, with occluded subclavians don't have rest pain. So they have normal oxygen saturation, but they would have lower blood pressure in that arm. Her blood pressure in her arms was about 70. Um, what about this one? This is a 32-year-old. No cardiovascular risk factors. I'll tell you what they did. They did a lima to LAD, a saphenous vein graft to the, to the CERC. It's the left main. What's that? Um, God, this would be an incredible spasm to see it at the origin of the left main like that. This is a real lesion. This is a real lesion. This is Takayasu's arteritis, okay? So giant cell and Takayasu's are the same disease pathologically, but they occur at a bimodal distribution. Takayasu's women less than 40. Giant cell, women greater than 60. And um, the sad thing is, I saw this patient when she developed angina again after her surgery. Why did she develop angina? Because she had reversal of flow through her lima. 
She had occluded her subclavian, which wasn't normal at the time of bypass. Nobody ever looked. She occluded it in the meantime, and uh, so she developed angina again. She also had bilateral common iliac lesions. And on MR, they get thickening of the aortic valve, thickening of the aortic wall. And in fact, on ultrasound, you can actually see the carotid arteries with concentric wall thickening. So when you see a lesion in somebody without the typical cardiovascular risk factors, think of these. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that what they did, you know, she needed an intervention. But um, you need to pulse them with steroids then, and you need to plan your intervention based on you know, what vessels are involved. People from India predominantly or South America often have, um, have abdominal tachyasus. This is a long, smooth narrowing in the aorta. This is the wandering artery of Drummond. It's a collateral blood vessel between the IMA, the uh, inferior mesenteric and the superior mesenteric artery. And it tells you that in this case, the superior mesenteric artery is occluded. And this woman um, had severe right arm claudication. Someone went in and tried to balloon her which is the exact wrong thing to do during acute inflammatory vascular disease, unless it's the heart and they're having an acute coronary syndrome. You treat them first, and then you decide whether or not you can treat them with an endovascular approach. Now, this has been a major area of my research, um, and uh, I just want to show you a couple things about this disease that you may not be aware of. One is, uh, well, first of all, the nomenclature has changed. This used to be called medial fibroplasia. It's now called multifocal FMD. It's the so-called string of beads, where there's alternate areas of narrowing and dilatation. This occurs in the mid and distal portion of the artery. This is a renal and a carotid, whereas athro occurs at the origin of the renal artery or at the carotid bifurcation. You never get atherosclerosis in this part of the carotid artery. You get it either at the bifurcation or at the carotid siphon. <clears throat> and this is the second most common type. This is focal fibromuscular dysplasia. And I'll show you a little bit more about this case in a minute. So it used to be classified pathologically. We rarely get pathological condition. Now the biggest mistake made with this disease is telling the patient they have a certain percent stenosis of an artery. You cannot look at the, any artery in multifocal disease and tell, number one, whether it's hemodynamically significant, or number two, whether or not they have a focal stenosis. So, um, or they have a significant stenosis. I would say this is probably the most severe. This is maybe the most mild. So if you're gonna be doing renal artery intervention, make sure in this disease, you always measure pressure gradients, okay? Make sure that you get a pressure gradient. And as you can see here, this ends up being the most severe and this ends up being the most mild. And if you do an angioplasty, make sure you measure a pressure gradient after because it's the only way you'll know if the patient has been adequately treated. Now, if you look at this, um, Okay, so you don't really need something to tell you this is a severe stenosis there, but this is OCT. Now look, the artery is very narrow and it enlarges. I wanna start this again because you're gonna see the webs come out on this artery. Look at it, it's narrow, it's enlarged, the webs are coming out. You're gonna see a dissection over in this part of the artery. So OCT can be very helpful in this. Um, you don't need to do it all the time, but there are certain cases, there's the dissection, and it really explains uh, physiologically what's happening. Now, the second thing with FMD is you need to do a pressure gradient even if the arteries look normal. 26-year-old, severe stenosis here. She has focal FMD, do an angioplasty there, did not put a stent in. The other side looks normal. If we stopped there, her blood pressure would not have been cured. We put a pressure wire in this, and you can see that 
there's something there, there's a 50 millimeter mercury gradient. So even when the artery looks normal in this disease, we measure pressure gradients, and actually she's been off blood pressure medications now for 10 years. That's after. This is what you don't want to do. I know you put stents in the coronaries, you put stents in the subclavian, the renals, the carotids, but that's for atherosclerosis. For FMD, FMD occurs in the mid and distal part of the artery. Remember, the kidney goes up and down and rotates. So you have a lot of stress on the stents in the distal portion of the artery. There's a stent fracture here. And now if the patient needs to undergo um, surgery, it becomes much more complicated. And the large majority of these people do not need to be stented. What's that? Balloon, 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 yes, it's safe. Not a cutting balloon, though. If you can't, if you can't blow the lesion, which you can almost always do with the string of beads type, but if it's focal FMD and you can't blow the lesion with a balloon, you're gonna, and you put a stent in, you're gonna see that dumbbell stent deformity. So it's not really that helpful. They should probably go to surgery then. That usually occurs in like teenagers and stuff. Not in multifocal, in focal it is. All right, this disease was first reported at Mount Sinai Hospital. Nobody here knows any, even knows that, or even knows anything about this disease. But I'm sure somebody in the audience does. What do we see? We see an ischemic ulcer. We see superficial thrombophobitis. There's only one disease that causes both of those. Thromboangiitis obliterans, or Berger's disease. Leo Berger was here. He was a urologist here. Yet he wrote a paper in 11 Ashkenazi Jews that reported on this first. And when you see someone like this 28-year-old female with an ischemic ulcer, and then you do an Allen test of the hand, you, you've already shown that um, you have disease in the lower extremities and upper extremities. So um, it was first reported at Mount Sinai Hospital, yet no one at Mount Sinai Hospital even knows that Leo Berger was here in 1908. Dr. Sharman knows, but no one else. All right, um, here you see these so-called corkscrew collaterals. The reason I show this is if you're thinking of doing a percutaneous endovascular procedure on these patients, the results are not very good. This is a small vessel occlusive disease. All right, I'm gonna finish up with um, three quick slides. What does this condition in golf have in common? Since the US Open is going on right now, uh, I thought this was appropriate. Anybody have any ideas? I told you it was gonna get harder as we go along. All right, so this is klippel trenonay syndrome. There was a professional golfer who sued the PGA because he wanted to ride in a golf cart because he had this. It went all the way to the Supreme Court and he won. His name is Casey Martin, but this is muscular hypertrophy of the legs, varicose veins, um, a port wine stain, and 50% have an AV malformation. Be very, very careful about doing venous ablation on these patients. They don't really have a good deep system. And here, here are the port wine stains. Now, what's wrong with this picture? The filter is, the filter's in the aorta. You guys don't want to do that, okay? Whoever put this in at a major medical center, not in New York, somebody put a filter in the aorta. And the last slide is this. How many IVC filters does this patient have? And if you can name them, that would be great too. How many? Four? Who said four? Okay. What's this? That's a Greenfield filter. What's that? That's a Venatech filter that didn't open. What's that? 
That's a Mobin Uden filter that's been taken off the market because it has a 100% thrombosis rate. What's that? That's a Venatec filter. This patient presented to the emergency department with a chief complaint of, I have pain, I need Demerol, um, I, I, I have pain, I need an IVC filter, and Demerol usually helps me in this situation. I, I, I kid you not. And so we sent the person home without a filter, without Demerol, but he has four IVC filters, and thank you. <laughs>